She's currently juggling her work at MIT for the research project at the University of Auckland, of Auckland and she's fascinated and working in medical healthcare robots. <coughs> Their, uh, have, have no hazards in pursuing their dreams and ambitions. 
distribution in terms of engineering. But girls here, as you can see, there are fewer girls and many boys here. Girls here always have this dilemma and keep on contemplating whether engineering is a right career path for them or not. So it's just a brief overview that I would like to give about myself today. Right, so I completed my Bachelor of Engineering in Electronics and Communication from an Indian university. And uh, in India, how it works is it's quite different from um, Auckland um, or New Zealand for that matter. Um, we get campus hired. So all the companies, um, recruited companies, come to the uh, campuses, college campuses, and they pick the cream of the crowd. They hire directly and give you an offer letter there. So I completed my Bachelor of Engineering there and worked in a couple of multinational companies, which is Capgemini. It's a US-based company and I worked there as a graduate software engineer. So I was doing coding, I was trained in Java, and uh, yeah, things were good. It was a big name, big bugs, and my parents were like thrilled. But I was like, hey, hang on, um, why am I actually here? Um, I did my bachelor's in electronics and communication, but here I'm a graduate software engineer. So I was just wondering, um, am I doing the right thing in life? Is this my real passion or dream? What is it? Do you want to be a graduate software engineer? But I was like, well, no, um, I would like to upskill myself and uh, prepare for the technological changes in the VLSI domain. So VLSI is very large scale integration. So as you must have seen, there were phones in the age old days. Not quite sure if you have seen such phones. They were bulky and had an antenna popping out. So nowadays the phones are much thinner and slimmer and they don't have an antenna popping out. It's because of all these chips here and your computer motherboard for example, um, even the Apple, I mean MacBooks or any other things, uh, initially computers were bulky and had big monitors and now it's so slim, the retina display and the MacBooks are like so thin. So that's because it's the advancement of uh, VLSI chip design, which is integrated circuit design, very large scale integration. So I had to upskill myself and completed my advanced diploma in VLSI design. After that, I worked in a few MNCs thereafter in an R&D IC design job and was really fulfilling. I thought this was my dream job. But then I realized, okay, I don't think I should be um, like involved in a team and do something with, uh, with others, monotonous, same kind of modules, what they do. I thought I should do something on my own, utilize my knowledge and do something on my own, like an individual project. So I thought, okay, let me get the global exposure. Let me not just confine, get confined to India. I, I just wanted to travel around, see how people are, what kind of studies are they doing? What is the university education that they are um, having? And just not wanting to be confined to India. So what I did was, I thought, okay, let me pursue my higher education in New Zealand. Many people ask me, why New Zealand? Why not US? Because most of the people from India end up in the US and just a small portion of the crowd comes to New Zealand. So I was like, well, New Zealand is a very good uh, uh, country, beautiful country, beautiful people, this is what I had heard. And uh, higher education in New Zealand, especially in the world ranked university, the University of Auckland, getting admission there was quite difficult. So I thought, okay, let, my, let me get my um, hands on this one. So I was like really happy, okay, very excited. Finally, I got into New Zealand. So when I came to New Zealand, oh my God, I came to New Zealand alone and I had, I just didn't know what to do. It was like an alien coming to a foreign place and I was like, cultural differences, um, how do I connect with the people, how about the accent, um, the knowledge. I was completely uh, lost basically. But um, I, I thought, okay, here I have taken a massive loan from India and for international students <coughs> at the Auckland University, it's almost like I think five times, like about 35,000 New Zealand dollars. And I was like, I have a big loan to pay and I can't just uh, get scared. And even today for that matter, I'm, I'm actually being very, very <coughs> nervous at the moment looking at you people. But then I was like, no, this is not the way. You should face your problems, face it, and then only you can encounter 
it or overcome all the um, failures or problems in life and then only you can reach heights and soar like a rocket. So I was like, okay, okay, that's fine. So apart from 35,000 New Zealand dollars, which is as part of your fees, you require about 15 to 20 New Zealand dollars per year, 20,000 New Zealand dollars per year for your living expenses. And as you know, the Indian currency and the New Zealand currency are like poles apart. Uh, the New Zealand currency is extremely high. So I was like, what do I do for a living here? It's like even a cup of coffee I couldn't afford. So I went to the university. I, I actually took up jobs of a professional note taker for students with disabilities and worked as a teaching assistant at the Auckland University. So I was lucky enough to get a teaching assistant role at the Auckland University because I had like um, voracious experience in terms of the FPGA design, real site design, IT design. So I was actually uh, given a great uh, teaching assistant job, which according to me was great then because I looked after all my living expenses. Also, professional note taker. I also uh, involved myself into professional note taker, and I must say that's not like a re really easy job. You need to be very responsible and attend your lectures more than um, what you do for yourself because you need to pay attention and you're helping someone with uh, a disability. So you have more responsibility on yourself and definitely it was not an easy job. Yeah, so I then with juggling jobs like TA and uh, professional note taker, I then graduated with my master's degree in electrical and electronic engineering with a distinction, with an honor, and I was absolutely thrilled about it. So after graduating from here, I got an FPGA design engineer at NDS Technology with uh, the means of Callahan Innovation R&D career grant. And uh, it was a fabulous job. I was involved in designing an intelligent load balancer, a network monitoring security equipment which was just, uh, I think it was my dream job. I did think that it was my dream job. But then, um, I was like, well, my ambition was to have my own bazooka and not really um, rely on other um, meager kind of uh, minor weapons. So my quest for knowledge and battling challenges continues as I now pursue my PhD. And this is my bazooka. And now I think that the, all the latest technologies uh, that are changing and the innovations, I'll be able to cope with such a bazooka. Um, so yeah, uh, coming to my focus on today's talk about women in engineering, I certainly believe that whether you take up electrical and electronic engineering or computer engineering or no, ma no matter mechanical, civil, whatever you take up, you can certainly become successful. Just do what you know best and pursue your dreams and passion. So my favorite lines from Steve Jobs, stay hungry, stay foolish, and never settle. So this is what I have been believing in. And thank you for giving me such a wonderful opportunity to speak here. And I look forward to seeing at least some of the faces at MIT or Oxford Uni. Wish you all the luck for your future endeavors.